affectionately call this the mom's panel. Um, I'm a little bit emotional because my role here at Canatech is I'm uh, direct the content community. And whenever we're trying to decide on design or influence, figure out exactly where our brand is and where it lands and what it needs to look like, I always try to remember why we do what we do. Why are we here? What is this platform about? And it's about providing quality care to the people who need it the most. And there is one community of people that need it very much, and those are children, our children. Um, this is a very special panel of mothers that are joining us who we believe are the heroes of this industry. We talk a lot about the industry from many, many different angles. These are the women that are driving the actual change, the change makers of this industry. They're the ones lobbying for the, for the change, for the policy, for the dosage, for the medications, for the standards. All the good stuff that we get to benefit from down the line starts here. So we are extremely grateful that you've joined us. Our panel is going to be emceed by Ms. Tali Berman, who is an autism specialist and a very, very dear friend of mine. Very grateful. I couldn't imagine anyone better to, to handle this beautiful conversation. Enjoy. everybody to the real heroes and the, these are the mothers these are the mother warriors thank you we might need tissues you might need tissues so there's tissues here there's tissues at the bar I'm sure we were talking just before how this is a very emotional thing for for them and for all of us um, just before we start before I introduce all these amazing mothers on the panel um, I just want to take a minute and say do a shout out to, first of all to the Canatech team that have done an incredible job of putting on this incredible event it is really an honor to have you here on this panel today. So we have about three questions that I wanted to talk about and give you each an opportunity to share. And the first thing that I think we all love to really hear from you is, is the story. How medical cannabis came into your lives, how it came into the life of your child, and especially how it made an impact um, in their health and healing where other medical treatments really failed. So you could just each take a turn. In 2009, uh, my son was given six months to live, and I remember driving home from the doctor's office, and I'm saying to myself, you know, my son is not going to die on my watch. And as a legal researcher, I went home, and I went to work. I, I actually um, did some research. I went to the library at the time. We were still using the library. And um, I knew that I needed to plead my case. Um, ultimately to the Supreme Court, which is his, his physicians. And so his physicians um, agreed with me that this was a option for me. And, um, you know, it, it, it was amazing, um, the results that, that came from um, not only me learning and being able to speak with, with doctors such as Lester Greenspoon, um, to be able to, to speak to, to the people where I'm getting the research from and they're helping me um, to save my son's life. And within three months of placing him on cannabis treatment, um, my son went from 42 pounds to gaining about 30 more pounds and actually interacting with his siblings, interacting with our dog, uh, being able to pay attention to the TV, being able to that I found cannabis helped our family find Joey's personality, actually helped him find life and quality of life for our family as well. And so, um, you know, to go back to 2009, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I just knew that I needed to do whatever it, it took for my son to be alive. And I'm so glad that I did. <laughs> so before you pass the microphone on, you guys are welcome to clap. <laughs> Can you share a little bit about, were there other things that you tried first, pharmaceuticals, conventional treatments? I think what we really want to hit home today is how everything else failed. I'm sure all of you have been through journeys of trying everything else first because you basically are forced to before this is even an option. And then how medical cannabis really changed that for you. Well, at the time, um, not only was Joey uh, 42 pounds, he was actually on about 14 different uh, medications. 
and these medications were used to treat the symptoms, autism symptoms. And every medication that uh, was given to us, the side effects was death and liver damage. So I really, um, you know, I, I, they advise us behavioral care. They advise us um, with, with using certain um, holistic type uh, treatments and nothing worked. And after the 14th medication, um, I knew that cannabis was, was going to be, um, you know, it was worth a try. It was definitely worth a try. And, and um, with the support team of his medical, his medical support team, we were able, able to do it all together as a team. Same question to you, Abby, a little bit about how it came into your life. I'll, I'll start with the second one because um, when we talk about medications, and my son received a lot of medication too, we have also have to understand that autism is unmet medical need, which means there's no one pharmaceutical drug that cures, heals, or treats the symptoms of autism. So the whole thing with, I, I know that cannabis is still, because there's so little we know about, considered to be uh, the last thing in medical. I think with autism it should be a little bit different because we don't have drugs for autism. Um, but I'll start from the beginning, how did I get to know? And <laughs> the truth is, no, the truth is I heard about cannabis from my 82 year old mother-in-law who is very tolerant to her son's smoking pot here and there. <laughs> She's very persistent, and she kept saying, you must try. <laughs> I'm joking. Can you but, just describe why you sh she was encouraging us? What was happening with Yuval at the well, time? That she knew what we were going through. Yuval is severely autistic. You mentioned you know him from nine years old. I don't think there's any therapy, anything we tried to help him uh, overcome his difficulties. He's still not verbal. And he has behavioral issues, but but by the time by the age he got when he was 16, about 16, he developed also epilepsy uh, seizures, and along with the seizures came behaviors um, that was impossible to handle. Self injurious, very severe self injurious behavior. He would bite his wrist again and again and have big scars all over, and outbursts. And I don't know. If anybody who doesn't experience living with this at home, even if the outburst is once in two weeks, you're still terrified. You still don't know when this outburst is going to come. So eventually what we did is going to the psychiatrist, trying this medication and that medication, putting this medication up and this medication, and, the, and, and you've all just got crazier and crazier. This is the truth. And without anything to do with cannabis, we just very slowly under medical supervision took him off all the antipsychotic medications and it was we were 27 4 to 27 uh, 24 7 at home with him three adults to take him off the drugs it was a very long process but eventually when he got clean from the antipsychotics he was better than he was with them and I'm not saying anything general about antipsychotics at the moment I'm talking about my son and for two years he got only anti-epileptic drugs, which he still gets now. We don't play with the seizures. Uh, but then we got access to cannabis about 18 months ago. And from day one it was a life changer. Yuval is still very autistic. He's sometimes he's very difficult to handle. But we don't have outbursts and we don't have aggressiveness and he smiles more and he's more calm so he's more communicative so he listens better what we ask him to do. So this is the place where we go to Congress. <laughs> Share your story how medical cannabis came to be a part of your life and Riley's life. 
Well, I think that her doctors were trying to figure out what was going on just as much as I did because they had no clue what type of tumor this was. They had no choice but to remove it or else it was going to consume her entire skeletal system of her head. So we couldn't back out of the surgery. The only other option would have been uh, chemo, which at the time they were just testing a certain type of chemo at Harvard and there was no proof that it would work. So it took them about two weeks to figure out how to go about this surgery. And they wouldn't tell us exactly how it was gonna happen. Um, my husband and I assumed that they were gonna put bone in place of the bone they were gonna take away. I did a ton of research, of course, and I kept coming up with, you know, that cannabis would help this tumor from coming back and had a 60% reoccurrence rate. The day before surgery, they give us a description of her surgery. It was going to be an all-day situation that she was going to be under. They were going to, um, the, the tumor had already uh, consumed most of the left side of her face. They were going to remove all of this bone. Sinus orbit was already missing. The, most of the uh, left maxilla was missing. The cheek, uh, bottoms of the eye orbit had already been uh, started eating away. And Everything had to be removed, the tumor, the margins that it had even touched. She was gonna lose all of her teeth. Her palate was already missing. And so she was pretty much gonna come out of surgery like a potato sack. And they just kept saying to us, um, we can't put anything in its place because it may make this tumor come back even worse. And it was a very world-renowned uh, plastic surgeon, and he just kept saying, you know, don't worry, plastic surgery is amazing, it's advancing, it's, you know, we can make her try to look as normal as possible, we're gonna do dental implants, um, we, can't, we just can't save her teeth, and we're, the point is we're gonna save her life. So I had already had cannabis in the back of my head, but as soon as I said this, it was a tipping point. I had to deal with brother and sister that were police officers, father who's a minister. Uh, it was rough. It was very rough. <laughs> so, but you know what? I didn't care. You know, that was my little kid. So, you know, she came out of surgery. They had, for some reason, stitched her teeth into the skin. No bone underneath. Um, every time she tried to drink water, her teeth like flipped brown in her mouth. Uh, she was on a liquid diet for um, an unknown amount of time. I wanted to wait to start her on cannabis because I didn't want to get caught. We were in an illegal state and I knew that they were going to do a follow-up MRI to make sure that they got all the tumor. They didn't. Uh, there was some of it that they couldn't reach, you know, way back in the sphenoid sinus. And so they did an MRI one month exactly from the date of surgery. She started cannabis one month and a day for the surgery. And every single follow-up MRI, that little bit of tumor shrank by about 25%. And not only that, her around her teeth started forming a crust of bone. And that crust of bone just started spreading and her doctor just kept saying, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you giving her? And I just kept saying, I'm giving her frankincense. <laughs> essential oil. <laughs> we actually ended up at Johns Hopkins, a different hospital, um, consulting with another plastic surgeon because some of the um, tumor cells had gotten into her jaw joint. And he was looking at her medical records and he just kept looking at her and looking at the medical records and he said, this is not the same child. This child did not have this surgery. I cannot tell that she's had this surgery. And he said, you know, underneath all that baby fat, and this was probably, you know, eight or nine months after surgery. And he said, underneath all that baby fat, yes, she looks a little messed up, <laughs> but everything that she needs is there to protect her. The bone is there. It's not perfect, but it's there. And I cannot tell that this child has had that happen to her. Her dentist, 
who, you know, her, the dentist and I were close, but, he, you know, he's very emotional about it. He was against, actually, cannabis. Her teeth roots started regenerating. When he saw that happen, he handed me $150 and told me to go buy her some more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, she's just been great ever since. Um, she did develop uh, seizures two weeks after surgery. We, you know, maybe something happened while she was under. But, um, you know, the, the cannabis has been very good at helping to control the seizures also. Wow, yes, okay, so take that story. So this is why you're the heroes, because you are absolute trailblazers, trailblazers. If you think about your journey, trying to make cannabis an accessible treatment for your child, what would you say was the biggest challenge that you came across? And what quality action do you feel helped you push through that challenge? The community, uh, my, my friends were very supportive. I had an action plan that if I get arrested, will you please give her this medication? <laughs> um, so the community was very supportive. Uh, when I wanted to um, go and try to make it legal, I actually went after the one senator that had spoken out against medical marijuana. He had voted no on the, on the adult law, and he had campaigned against it, and I figured, if I can take out the biggest bully, I can get them all. Yeah. And it worked. <laughs> and so, yeah, I had him come talk to Riley, and I invited him over to the house, showed him all the medical records, and I had him talk to her, and she just explained to him how, you know, that she was a straight-A student when she's on this cannabis, and when she is not on it, she can't eat because it hurt. And, the inflammation was so bad, and that all she wanted was just to be a normal little kid. And it just, it, it got him like that, and he's been our champion ever since. And it's amazing, because I know there's many families I know that would love to use it as an option, and the fear of your children being taken away is, is a very real fear. And that's what you were presenting with. So, thank you. Abigail, you want to answer the same question? To get the, the cannabis for you found, it was 18 months ago, because a uh, neurologist is uh, Professor Uri Kramer, who does all the retrospective study about kids with seizures and cannabis. And he's a friend of mine. And he's a lovely man. But you feel free to talk to me the, however he likes. And I called him and I said, Uri, I want cannabis for Yvonne. And Yvonne doesn't comply. Um, to the uh, qualified condition for epilepsy because he's balanced with seizures with drugs. So he said, get out of here, I'm not giving you cannabis. I said, okay, but you find me another doctor who will. He said, okay, and he thought I'll forget. <laughs> yes, I, know, I, I didn't. <laughs> and we live in the same neighborhood and it was August and there were 40 degrees in the shade and his wife sent him to the supermarket on Friday. <laughs> I got him, put her under the tree. I said, Uri, you find me a doctor now. <laughs> so he started making calls, but it wasn't easy to find a doctor that will. It's not only, that we have the Ministry of Health and the qualifying condition. Yuval got his um, license under compassion treatment. We don't have yet autism as qualifying condition, even though uh, they are very um, uh, positive attitude to it. Eventually find me a doctor who is very, he treats a lot of people with post-trauma, uh, with cannabis, he believes a great deal in it, and he filed for Yuval and we got the access for it. But this doctor was um, a lovely man, honest enough to tell me, look, I understand cannabis and post-trauma, I don't understand autism. So after you get the access, I don't know what you should be given to him. So I think the biggest obstacle for you all was just getting their access. Finding a doctor who is willing to deal with treating cannabis for autism. I understand the risks in cannabis. I understand there's not enough knowledge about long time use and the medical community worries. Um, I was just telling here to Mickey Dor, I think he was there a second ago, um, that few years before we got cannabis, um, I went to Ivan Nora, or he was on sabbatical, I went to someone else and I asked her what do you say about cannabis and she said, um, 
she said, well, they are, and I came there with you from severely autistic, non-verbal, self-injurious, okay? And I said, what do you say about cannabis? And she said, I don't know, there are research showing it affects the intelligence. So I looked at her and I said, doctor, PhD at Harvard, next reincarnation. Now talk to me. So eventually, Yes, and a big part of what we're doing is educating medical professionals to understand the power that it can help your child. My biggest challenge was my family. Um, I also have two narcotics detectives. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> As uncles, uh, my brother's a fireman, and we come from a very conservative uh, Christian family. And so being able to be open to my family was one of my biggest challenges. Um, and then I had one more challenge, and that was walking off the set of Good Morning America and being able to help the millions of families who saw me on that day uh, in 2009. And so, uh, you know, on that day I made an oath uh, that every family that contacted me, that I would help them. And I continue to maintain that oath, um, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm here, is because I feel uh, for every family that contacts me, I go back to that place where I was in 2009, watching me, or watching me watch my son almost pass away. And so um, I know it's something, um, with special needs families, we have this certain bond, and if you call, we'll pick up. So, <laughs> my biggest challenge is sleep. I don't sleep anymore. <laughs> But it's definitely, um, my, my son has given me a purpose, and it has given me some of the best friends, um, best, best friends and best moms that I could have ever uh, met. You know, I'm here because of Abigail. I'm in California, she's in Israel. And no matter where we are, we connect wherever, so we just have this bond, this is us. And so, um, the one thing that I can tell you is cannabis has not only brought my son life, but it's brought me life that I didn't have before. You talk about this for like hours and hours and days and days, levels of the impact in your life, life of your family, life of the purpose in your, in your life. I'm just curious, I'm not going to talk about this at length, but has your family turned around a little bit since they've seen its impact with Joey? There was one year I told my father that um, I placed Joey on cannabis. And he did not speak with me for about six months. And he came over for Christmas, and he walked into Joey's room, and very, for the very first time, his grandson had made eye contact with him. My dad left with tears in his eyes. He didn't say goodbye to me, he just left. He called me back a couple of days later and apologized to me. And he's been my biggest supporter. You know, when I called him and told him I was coming here, he, I've made him so proud to be here. I don't know about you, I'm sure many of you who are listening today, but I for sure feel this like swelling desire to do whatever we can to help this path be easier for you, to help hundreds and thousands of families and their children have medical cannabis be a more viable, accessible option, not having to go through 14 other pharmaceuticals first. So in your experience, what would you say is the single thing, the single action that we can take to help move this movement forward? Whoever wants to take it first. Well, here's what I would say. My little girl and I did this by ourselves. No help, no support. We stood in front of hundreds of legislators, shaking in our boots, and we were able to get two laws passed unanimously. So even if you feel like you're the only one fighting, do it. If you there's something that you need to change that just seems like a mountain, don't worry about it. Try it, do it, you would be shocked because I just, I knew that once I took that step, there was no turning back, and I can't believe what we were able to accomplish. So it just shows that 
a little voice could be come up with it. <laughs> My experience is totally different. I feel I have a lot of support. I think Israel is fairly liberal when it comes to medical cannabis. We have vast cannabis medical plan. We have people who are very much for it. So it's easier maybe. I think the breakthrough was due to Sharon who sits here, who is my um, partner. She's just old news because she's three years in the business. <laughs> But um, uh, I, I feel uh, there's a lot of support, but I understand the need of the medical community to have papers, to have scientific research, to have clinical data. I mean, we didn't have enough funding for uh, proper uh, study, so I decided I'm going to do it by myself. So me and Sharon, what we do, we have uh, today, I think, over 60 kids, and we built... Um, um, Questionnaires, the parameters about behaviors and different strains, and we do it in collaboration with Professor David Mayer's lab. So we really hope that soon we won't be just mums screaming cannabis helps, but we also have a proper scientific paper showing it does because what we experience each day, and Sharon who guides the uh, parents really gets a lot of phone calls every day, some of them very distressing, but some of them just say, look, the kid was like this, he suddenly talked to me, he suddenly was quiet, he was sitting, I mean, we experience it on a daily basis. Join, uh, it, join us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I decided um, that I was going to stay in this industry for every family that contacted me because we all need to know um, how to navigate, where to go, who to go to. Um, and, I, and I feel like that's, since I kind of kicked the door open in the States, I need to remain that, that point person for them. So more families could not only have the legal protection, but to be able to have direction. <laughs> Something that I didn't have in 2009. And so, and so I have uh, made it kind of my job to be able to direct every single family um, to whatever resources they need all across the country. What's incredible to me is that you've done all this for your kids, but then you didn't stop there. You went to like advocate and push laws through and legislature and answering every phone that's, that, that rings. So I'd love if we could all just like stand and cheer and support and honor these incredible women.